Yes, there's a, uh, the way it works, for those of you who have any interest in this subject at all, um, is the guest editor is invited to solicit um, an amount of work and um, also is sent a lot of work from the um, publisher's editors and the issue is supposed to balance out about 50-50 um, between those two pools, which means the delicate problem facing a guest editor is soliciting enough work that you have stuff you're excited about to form those, I think it's 90 out of 180 pages, um, but not soliciting so much that you end up having to go back to the people you're soliciting and go, actually, I can't use what you sent me, because that's demoralizing for a writer. You're sort of like, you know, I really want your thing, not that much. No. <laughs> <laughs> Love to have you in the issue, although if this is what you're sending, I don't, I don't want to load it, I don't want it that much. So you actually, you find yourself in a little, uh, I think most guest editors would say the, the most exciting aspect of it is when you're waiting for the solicited stuff to come in and you're thinking, is there going to be enough? Is there going to be too much? I think to the other half of it, you have faith that the, the quality of the work you're going to be sent by the plowshares editors is strong enough that it's not going to be, then it's just a matter of like, which are the top stories here. And that part seems much more straightforward. You're like, oh, I love this, I love this, I love this. The other stuff, you sort of like, you know, like um, I solicited a story from Amy Bender, and Amy said, oh, I'd love to do this. And then she wrote me an email and said, I'm really loving the story. It's now 48 pages. And I was like, great. <laughs> And I'm thinking, oh my God, I have these other... But you know, the other thing I do, if I'm in that situation, is, is try to match up writers in that way. So you solicit Amy Bender, who's going to go long. You solicit Amy Hempel, you know you're going to get something this big. Right? If you get anything at all. Because you know, Amy's always going, it didn't work at all! And so, so you have, you know, you try to have the balance out that way. But that, that's the main experience. There's very little logistics involved. Well, one of the good things about writing fiction <laughs> is you can, in fact, fill in the gaps. Um, and in fact, I think, as I understand, the, the kind of fiction that I write, historical fiction that I write, relies on those gaps to some extent. Like, I, I'm not that interested in writing about people whose every moment has been chronicled. So like, you know, what was Winston Churchill doing at the height of the Blitz? We know every single moment in his, I mean, everything's been chronicled. So. I'm not interested in writing the kind of thing where I make other people's un understandings of these people come alive. Like that I, you know, we know that this is when he decided you know, to send up the heavy bombers, so I'm going to dramatize that moment when he sits up in bed and he goes, I'm sending the... You know, I don't want to do that, necessarily. <laughs> so I've often chosen people who there are places where nobody knows what happened uh, during those moments. Uh, there's a reason that a lot of fiction has been written about what Christ was doing between the ages of 12 and 33, because... <laughs> There's just a big gap. Right? Um, nobody knows what he was doing. Um, and one of the first major historical things I ever undertook was um, about uh, Murnau, the silent film director. There's very, very little written about or recorded uh, about his life in certain stretches because his family was uh, mortified by his sexuality and simply won't release the information, which gave me unbelievable room to maneuver, essentially. But it also means that stuff that can't be pinned down by a historian can be pinned down by a fiction writer. Um, for example, the, the, um, the standard story about Murnau is that he was in the Luftwaffe in the First World War, crash landed in Switzerland, um, found himself directing an opera company, and immediately following that found himself uh, making a film. And this has been, that's the unquestioned version of Murnau's entry into film. And when you start researching a story like that, you sort of go, well, wait, wait let's go back. He crash landed in Switzerland in World War I. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a World War I aircraft, <laughs> but it's essentially like a chicken coop with an engine on it. Um, you don't very often crash landed and survive, or at least survive unhurt. When I researched it more fully, I discovered that, in fact, he had crash landed, he had crashed his plane seven times without getting hurt, all on his own aerodrome, and then it crashed in Switzerland. And I'm like, huh, what a lucky fellow. <laughs> then I discovered that the great love of his life um, had been killed in the trenches a couple weeks before he crash landed in Switzerland. And then I thought, you know, I bet when you crash land in Switzerland and you stumble out of the wreckage, somebody doesn't come up to you and go, you don't want to 
direct an opera company, do you? Because we don't have anybody. And all of this seems very, seems very clear to me that Murnau saw his lover killed and deserted. Essentially said, I'm, I'm finished with this war. And arranged in advance that there would be work for him in Switzerland. German historians are mortified by that. Uh, both because Murnau is a national hero, and I'm claiming he deserted, but also there's no proof of that. And, I know, and as a, a couple of historians wrote me and said, you know, that you, you can't really make a claim like that. And I wrote back and I said, I can't make a claim like that if this is biography. I can't make a claim like that if this is history. But guess what? And I'm satisfied. Um, and that's one of those moments when I, I, I think I have a responsibility to try and find out as much as I possibly can. And in fact, if I'd found out something that suggested it wasn't desertion, then I would have been in a quandary, and I think I would have had to say, no, I, I can't do this. What I will do is make up stuff when I know I'm not going to find out better information. But what I won't do is overturn information that I'm already persuaded by. Um, I also don't have interest in that kind of historical thing. You know, imagine the Germans won World War II. Well, that's, <laughs> they didn't, so let's move on. <laughs>
you try to remember that you're going to be putting in 80% of your time in revision, which seems like a mind-bending number when you're first starting out. Um, but it's mostly true, I think. Um, and I also have a, a little bit of a trick that I suggest to my students, and that is that um, once they finally do have a draft and they're ready to start thinking about it as an entirety, and this is also a way I suggest they read other people's work, Having read the whole through, thing through once, as though they were a normal human being, just reading it for effect, they then go to the very last few pages and read those carefully and without stopping go right around to the beginning, as though the beginning is supposed to lead <laughs> to the last few pages, as though the last few pages have come out of the beginning, and as though you read all the way through the story with those last few pages in mind. This is where you went. This is where you ended up. Does that make sense given everything else you've done? That actually helps you quite a bit with proportion. It helps you quite a bit with structure. It helps you quite a bit with sort of basic questions like, why did I dramatize the whole trip to the beach and summarize mom's MS? You know, what, what was up behind that decision? Why did I proportion it that way? You know, that sort of thing. So that's another trick about revision. Um, but really, the main uh, uh, suggestion I keep giving people about revision is don't stint on it. Revision is where you have to confront the mess you made. Revision is much less fun. So everybody wants to hope that whatever revision they've done already is enough revision. Because composition is where you feel like the artist with the wind in your hair. You know, you're like, oh, I'm so creative. <laughs> and then revision is like, what the Christ is this? What was I thinking? Both dogs talk? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs>